Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Aristotle, one of the great philosophers, said education is an ornament in prosperity and a refuge in adversity. I'm reminded of Aristotle because our guest today is a fan of ancient history. And like Aristotle's most famous student, Alexander the Great has placed great value on education and the importance of curiosity for any leader. Hello and welcome to another episode of the No Limitations podcast, where we meet the elite, world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I'm your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blender Partners Executive Search and Board Advisory Firm. This episode with Michael Byrne, Chief Executive of Toll, doesn't take a backward step and is an open and honest appraisal of a non-PC CEO who is on an agenda to deliver a tremendous transformation and turnaround program across a company covering 55 countries and over 40,000 staff. This is a journey worth listening to. Michael's previous roles include Chief Executive Officer of Coates Hire, Linfox and Westgate Holdings and also a non-exec director of Australia Post. Michael currently serves on the Osgrid board and is a member of the New South Wales Freight Advisory Council. In this episode, we cover the insights and experiences of a CEO in a global and highly competitive industry. We learn about the early influences in Michael's life and growing up in a family business, the values of experimentation, taking risks, straight talking, and focusing on results, and thinking globally as an executive, and the importance of education if, as a nation, we are to compete. So sit back and enjoy this wide-ranging and highly stimulating conversation delivering to the world with Michael Byrne. Michael, welcome to the show. Good morning. Michael, can you uh, maybe talk us through the journey? I understand you as a 12 years old, you uh, started driving the first truck. Well, that is true. I was around 12. My mother, my mother actually owned a trucking business, mm -hmm. which was uh, passed down from her father. And um, I was the oldest son and she as she still does today, believes that you should be brought up in a very old-fashioned way. I had a year sweeping floors, a year as a tyre fitter, a year as a meat lump, or a year as washing trucks, a year as a loader. But I started to learn how to drive a truck when I was about 12, highly illegal. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, particularly on the roads, I still think my mother should be punished for that. But um, that is a long while ago. I also spent a lot of time on farms. About half the family had farms and our side of the family had a trucking business. So what was the sort of the scale of the, uh, of the business, Michael? Well, we did all Woolworths and Coles at that time to country supermarkets. So we were a specialist regional carrier in New South Wales. There was about 40 trucks, about 100 men, and we carted uh, retail goods, freezer and chiller out to Dubbo and Tamworth and, yep. and then brought hanging meat back out of the abattoirs. And how far were you driving in those days? Today? No, when you were 12 years old. Uh well, when I was 15, my longest run on a Monday night was uh, from Sydney through Mudgee to Gunnedah and back with a load of hanging meat back into the old home bush abattoir with my Uncle George, who was about 85 at the time. So you weren't stopped by any uh, boys in blue at the time then? No. <laughs> was that the beginning of the passion to the logistics sector? I don't know if it was a passion. It was what uh, I'd grown up in and seen all my life and uh, my father didn't work. And my mother ran the business, ran the family. My grandmother was deeply involved in the family. It was very uh, matriarchal right, okay. and very different. And then the family from the country was also very matriarchal. So what was the culture of home like? Look, I, I had a very privileged upbringing, but it was hard. 
I used to work Monday nights, Wednesday nights, Thursdays and Saturdays, except in soccer season. Whilst during school? Whilst I was in school. So I got paid $100 a week. Okay. So which, you were in sixth class going into the first year you yeah. uh, high school? Four, six till ten. Yeah. And uh, my mother gave me $100 a week, but like any good woman, she took it back. <laughs> and uh, But she did give it to me on my 21st birthday in a, a, a shoebox and a plastic bag. And um, that's how Leah and I bought our first uh, place. So um, it was very work orientated, very sport orientated. It was no excuses for anything. And that's uh, stuck with you all this time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of people, it has, yeah. Did you uh, ever get asked to um, take over the family business? Um, the family business, I, was, I went to university and then about two years in, I wasn't, I wasn't great. My marks went down from about when I was 17 when I met my wife. Okay. So I had really good marks and then I started going out with my wife and my marks started to go down. My mother then actually in the end of year 11 made me go for two months on a prawn trawler in the Gulf of Carpentaria uh, to see how committed I was to my wife, my future wife. But That's hard, yeah. That's hard work too, isn't it? That was hard work. First time I ever had a drink, I was violently ill drinking overproof <laughs> rum. I still remember that at Normanton. So it was a long time ago. I think that the business then, my mother and father got divorced. Very, very tough thing in a, a strict Irish Catholic family. And the business didn't survive that and the breakup of the family, the bigger family, there was a lot of sides taken, unfortunately. It was a very difficult time. And the business was sold and got sold to a guy called Bill Marinick, right? who owned Rapid Transport. Then six months after that, it got sold again and I went with it as a shuttle to uh, May Nicholas. Oh, so that's where the career started with Maine. Yeah. Now you, and you went to university and you studied an uh, interesting sort of, I guess, course during that period of time. Well, I went to university when I was 17 or 18 and didn't finish because the family broke up and I had to go to work with, in the family business. And so I left economics the first time, yeah. uh, but I wasn't a great student towards the end, distracted and not doing well enough. And then I went back subsequently in my early 30s, late 30s and 40s. So I went back, I went to Darden Business School in Virginia. Right, okay. And then doing a lot of mathematics and tearing apart balance sheets and annual reports. Then I went to University of Denver and did a Master's of Science in Infrastructure and Transportation. And then I went to MIT at Sloan School in the end. So, and, and that was driven by other people, not so much myself, particularly Lindsay Fox and Peter Fox, mm -hmm. who um, kept saying, we think you're really good, but you're not good enough to get the jobs you want. So, other did, you have, did you have confidence in yourself or was it these guys encouraging elements you couldn't see? Probably a bit of both. At Mains, and I just went to his funeral the other week, uh, John Ladeek, who was sort of a legend of the, the transport industry, who was very, very good to me. He promoted me at 24, 25 to a really big job. Mm -hmm. And he saw something. I was probably a bit brash, but I had a lot of confidence from my upbringing. I knew how to drive a truck, how to work a truck, how to work a yard. And uh, a lot of people didn't. So it's sort of instinctive in that sense, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So I had a lot of promotions, particularly in my early 20s at May Nicholas, who are amazing to me, where I think I had seven promotions there in 11 years. But what basically, you, What did you start out as, Michael, at May? Oh, I think General Dog's Body would have been the best uh, <laughs> description of it, but was um, just as an account manager, uh, okay. an area manager. And then I... Around 24, a little bit after, maybe not much, I became the state manager of Rapid Transport and MNTM. And then uh, Lynn Fox came in and acquired the organisation? No. So then Mains, I ended up at Lynn Fox, but um, I was at Mains for uh, nearly 11 years and there was lots of people who I took every job no one else wanted. Okay, right. So every job that was really tough, really nasty, I took those sort of jobs. And then... We moved, I moved to Brisbane and commuted and then we moved to Melbourne and I was in a corporate role and we had two babies in Melbourne. Leah had three babies under five and my, mains were fantastic to me. And uh, But it was like being in the military nearly in those days. Um, you took your promotions or you were out. Mm. So I got offered a promotion and it's every person's dream. I got offered my choice of promotion. I could start in a month, but it was in Shanghai, Taipei or Jakarta, I think. I can't really remember. And uh, I went to Leah and saw her in Cabruni Hospital and she's got a baby 
in the bed next door and she's got two at home and she said, no, <laughs> that's it, uh, you're not going. So I went back to Mainz and said, I'm not going. And they said, thanks, your career's over basically. So I left and then I ended up at Westgate with Sam Tarasco. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I was an MD. I was about 32, 33. And then I wanted to come back to Sydney and then I went to Lynn Fox and uh, was there for 15 years. And then Lynn Fox in the end, but not in my time as the MD, through Peter Fox and Andrew Fox and um, a guy called Rex Combe. They bought a big chunk of mains where I'd worked. And then when I was at Lynn Fox, I bought Westgate. So it's a very small industry. How did you find fitting into the, uh, the Lynn Fox family business? Well, they're amazing. They're amazing family. They're full on. There's no doubt about that. They're very good operators. Bill Kelty is obviously extremely important as well in that environment. The Foxes, they gave me enormous opportunity. I was there 15 years. They helped educate me. They mm -hmm. spent a lot of money on me. You'll have to ask them if they, they thought that was a worthwhile investment. But they were very, very detail-minded, and I think that's really important in our business when it's asset-heavy, Mm -hmm. people heavy and extremely low margins, two, threes and four percent at EBIT level, uh, you have to be very, very detail minded. And they, they have never lost that ability as a lot of the good operators in our sort of industries to be really detail minded and cut through all the waffle. And also get growth. Well, growth, anyone can get growth. It depends on the definition of growth. Do you want revenue growth? Do you want yield growth or do you want profit growth? Uh, and, and what is the growth of the business? Is it the growth of the the P and L, the balance sheet, or the free cash flow? Uh, and I think people, a lot of times, only look at things very one dimensionally. Yeah. Uh, if you're in a family business, you want free cash flow growth, yeah. <laughs> right? If you're in a startup, you want revenue growth. If you're in an old style industrial business, you probably want EBIT growth and the continued dilution of debt. Mm. So I think the definition of growth has to be looked at depending on the type of business it is, the sector, and dimensionally where you want to be. Well, you've got to give them absolute credit for their, I guess, their courage to go offshore. One of the few Australian organisations which has been incredibly successful offshore, and you were part of that. Yeah, they went offshore before me. I've spent uh, I've spent nearly 30 years now in Asia mm -hmm. and the subcontinent, so I'm very comfortable there. Tomorrow I head off again to Hong Kong for meetings to Friday. I've, Meetings Saturday afternoon and then Sunday and then I'll be in Japan next week. So I'm very used to it. The Fox has also helped with that. May and Nicholas were the first people to send me to Asia. That's how long ago that was. But they're, they are visionary and, and they take a risk and you can do that sometimes in a family business as well and think generationally. What was the toughest of all the nations that you tried to open up? I've got one in mind. Uh, I know India wasn't the easiest place. But I was supposed uh, to be in India this week but found a way to be sick. But um, <laughs> I've, I've been there 54 times to is India. That, is that right? Since 2003. And I couldn't go to India this week, unfortunately, because of some operational issues and we're deep into financial planning. And uh, India, India is the toughest place I've ever worked. India, apart from a toll, I've never made money in India. Uh, at all the years I've been there. It's just an extremely complex environment. We've had some big businesses there. The Foxes went to India. I think I went there with Lindsay and then Peter in 2003. It's a remarkable place, but it's a very difficult business environment. And people talk about it'll be like China. It'll never be like China, in my view, because they have democracy. And it's a wonderful thing there. And it's a full-on democracy with 1.3 billion people. But we have a good business in India. We, we make money there but it's a very complex place to work. Just taking it back a bit, why, why do you think you were successful at Lynn Fox? Because you say the business was well-known. Lindsay built the business. The family supported that and grown. You're the new boy on the block. You're not part of the family. You've taken that business. You're also part of a, a growth play, which is local and international. Why were you successful? Well, I think I came from a family business. So my mother had instilled uh, a lot of really old-fashioned old skills which I think the Foxes do as well, Bill Kelty does as well. And detail-mindedness, they were very supportive and thought very long-term. I think as a leader, you have to be able to do two things. You have to think extremely long-term. Mm -hmm. You also have to be in the absolute minutiae of the detail to work out where the money pool is made from. And they helped hone that, I knew that, 
I've been brought up that way. Sam Tarasco as well in a big family business, one, another one of Australia's richest men, they think the same way. So I think I was a success there because the business was successful anyway before I got there. And then we there was a good plan to work through things. And they forgave experimentation, which is another important thing. Absolutely. How do you lead, Michael? Well, it depends. I think you have to have more, a lot more than one thing in your kit bag. So I think what appeals to you won't appeal, won't appeal to the person sitting beside you. So you can't lead one way. You need to try to understand the audience and unpeel them if you can. Not every situation's the same. So you can't act and behave the same over multiple years because it doesn't resonate with people and they get tired of the same messaging. So you have to try to adapt or change while still being authentic because the worst thing that and everyone can quickly sniff out if you're never authentic. So you, you can't swap and change too much, but yet you can't have the same messaging or same behaviour. So I think you have to change how you lead while being authentic. Um, there's some things that you won't change. So I'm very direct. Yeah. I'm, I'm very uh, engaged. I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. I think that anything can be said but as soon as you walk out the door five minutes later, you, you or whoever has let it go. You've got to let things go. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to move on quickly. You've got to try to push everyone as hard as you can for them to reach their potential, even if it's uncomfortable for both of you. No one I've met so far in my life, including me, who's re reached their potential. So I think you have to really uh, try to push people along and that, that, that's a really difficult discussion mm. because people make it happen. The balance sheet or the cash flow or the P&L is just an outcome of people's efforts. So you have to push people along. Can you sort of give me an example on early, early days? You talked about experimentation, given the freedom of experimentation. Was there an experiment that you tried, you thought, my God, I've got this completely wrong, but actually... Oh, how many actually, are there? But actually came out okay, <laughs> surprisingly. There's been lots of mistakes. I'm 54 this year. Um, this is my 16th or 17th year as an MD. Uh, my fourth time at bat, if we haven't think I've made a lot of mistakes, uh, we're kidding ourselves. I think I've done five acquisitions, only five or six acquisitions over my time. Two would be amazingly successful. Yeah. One of them for no reasons that I put in the ori original business case. <laughs> so I think two have been, one, one's been a disaster, mm -hmm. one has been average, but for nothing that could be foreseen. And one was about the business case. So my record's probably better than most, but one of them was for nothing that I ever anticipated. Uh, I was just got lucky on particularly property. Experimentation, I think the biggest experiments are on people and most of them have always worked out. Picking people, as we have been at Toll, we've changed half our leadership team, 153 people, a half of them have been changed and half of that half have been young people who have been promoted. Now, they're an experiment. Everyone would say you go through this process and you pick the 40-year-old and the 50-year-old and uh, more you pick the people who have this really nice, steady career. But I think you experiment by picking some people and giving them a real go and supporting them. There's always jewels in an organisation that haven't been unleashed. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta back them. And who, who would have thought? And I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was that far out of the box. Annette Carey, who was the chief legal counsel of Absolutely. Lynn Fox, and she replaced me. Mm. Now it's not very, in a transport business. A, it's not usually a female who runs it. Yep. Two, it's never the lawyer. Who's, but she did an amazing job. Yeah, she now she's at Australia Post in a very senior role, I believe. Yes. So I think the big experiments where most of them go really well is on the people and backing them. Did Toll take an experiment on taking you on board? And why did you why did you take the role? I wouldn't say that, that was an experiment. I think that John Mullen and Japan knew exactly the type of business or person that they wanted because of our particular issues. Do you want to talk us through what did you walk into and, and, and again, what was the motivation to take it? Well, my mother was ringing me actually at six o'clock every morning because I was having six months off and ringing me every morning, six o'clock, saying, that is a true story, 
it's a disgrace that someone as well trained as you doesn't have a job. Go back to work. You're only fifty. So that was my starting call with my mother at six a.m. every morning. That is a true story. And then um, Leah wasn't very happy me being at home either. <laughs> so it was imperative to get a job for the family relationships and to get my mother to stop ringing me. And then John Mullen, who I know very well, rang me, and then we had lunch, famous lunch. He had a broken arm at the time and said, I think I'm going to have a job as a chairman and I need you, your particular skills. I think they call us yin and yang. He's supposed to be the charismatic statesman-like uh, person on the blunt instrument. And, look, it was a very, like it's an amazing business. It was around about $8 billion of revenue, 44,000 people, 54 countries, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it had its real great difficulties probably from how it had grown up. So it had grown up through 113 acquisitions. Right. It had been a powerhouse of the Australian market and it had been built by a whole lot of people in a different time, in a different time. And the time 15 years ago when they did it was probably exactly the right thing to do as an, as an accretive EBITDA model. Yeah. But when you've got 44,000 people, you've got to run it and there's a really different skill set to that and and we had our issues particularly from a lack of integration and then some headwinds in global economy, economics, commodity, and then we had some uh, really big issues to confront. And an interesting ownership model as well. Yeah, owned by Japan Post and, and we're very lucky to have them. Uh, they've been amazingly good to us and good to me. Japan Post, 31st largest business in the world, 400,000 employees, 10th largest bank in the world, 13th largest insurer in the world, third largest post office in the world. So these are people at the top of the global food chain, 31st largest business. And I have the great privilege to spend a fair bit of time with them and I'll be there next week for the week. To, so I get to see them 10 times a year. Uh, they come to Australia twice a year. And we're very lucky to have them. We wouldn't have been able to work ourselves out of our issues, which are not all over. I'm in my third year uh, and we still have some deep issues that we have to resolve, but we couldn't do it without Japan Post. So what was the message that Nagata's son gave you? Famously was uh, fix it and hurry. <laughs> and uh, I'm probably not hurrying enough in his view. What's the timeline you're working to, Michael? Well, CEOs are employed forever or when they're sacked tomorrow. So that, that is CEO MD life and that's how it should be, top of the food chain. And I, I'm very used to that after 17 years. And the business has made enormous progress on many fronts, mm. safety, regulatory, yeah. operations, people, customer, NPS, DIFOT. We, we still have a long way to go to be a high-performing business financially that we we still have to do a much better job with the capital that we have deployed. This is a really big business and we're still not doing well enough. We're, we're much better than we were. We lost, we reported a $5 billion loss Japanese year FY17. We had a cash loss of about $1.5 billion, if, which is you, you only can have a few parents in the world who can, and right. can write that check. $1.5 bill. $1.5 bill. And uh, five billion, just under five billion cash, uh, five billion impairment and cash. So we made we made one hundred and twenty million dollars Jack J Gap uh, numbers EBIT uh, FY eighteen, which is tiny. We have three billion of invested capital and eight point eight billion of revenue. So yes, the business is back in profit, yeah. but not a high performing business. And so, so what's the definition then of fix it? The definition of fix it for me is a safe business. We're in a very, the most dangerous or second most dangerous game in the world. Road transport logistics, it's either construction or transportation. In North America, for instance, 40% of all fatalities at work are in transportation. Currently, Australia is, logistics is the most dangerous industry. It's usually construction, mm -hmm. Last year it was transport. It'll probably go back to construction. So we've got millions of high-speed interactions every single day. There's 16,000 trucks on the road for us around the world. We're having millions of high-speed interactions every day. We have about three or four bad truck accidents a day. Right. 
so far this year we've had uh, end of Jan or mid January, we've had ten fatality accidents around the world this year. So one one toll person uh, was killed two weeks ago in New South Wales hitting a tree. The others have been other people, two pedestrians, two bicyclists, and people in cars making bad decisions in front of a very big truck, and it's all over in a second. A little bit of G force. So for me, we must be safer. Two, the business must be at the highest end of ethical conduct and behaviour. You can see from the Banking Royal Commission how people expect people to behave. It's probably nearly the second biggest change in my working life on how behaviour of executives and behaviour of companies must continue to change and evolve. And that's a very challenging discussion, Mm. really challenging around the world on what is ethics, what is great behaviour, what is is, uh, the framework of how the business thinks. So safety, regulation, compliance, ethics, behaviour, probably then numbers. You've got to get a return on the investment. Yeah. And we're still not doing that. Uh, the business hasn't done that for a long time uh, and uh, I need to continue to work with the team to fix that. Then I think it's customers. Customers pay the bills. We've got to keep driving NPS scores and DIFOT. In our game, DIFOT's the, uh, delivered on the, in full and on time and accurately. And then somewhere in there I've got to give people not only great hope, and when you lose $5 billion, a lot of people don't have a lot of hope. Yeah. You, you've got to reach into their heart and to give them hope and you've got to allow them to have a career. You, you've got to be able to encourage them to have a, a, a real career and not just a job. So as a CEO, you've, you've come on board. The business is, in, in obviously, in trouble. You've got a, an ownership which is trying to believe in you and you're the next person to come on board, take this business forward, which means there's a change in agenda, and there's a transformation. As the CEO, how did you set about moving this transformation program and getting people to believe into up and down the change agenda? Well, one, not everyone's going to agree with you, so don't worry about it too much, that 44,000 people, to start with, you only need probably 100 acolytes, maybe less, if you wait to get a thousand, two thousand, you'll be dead. Yeah, right. So you've got to pick whoever it is, uh, just a few people to help you on the journey at the beginning. I remember when I walked into Toll on the second of January, because they would usually close for Christmas. Mm-hmm. There was only like half a dozen people there on a whole floor, and uh, one lady there. She'd been there since November, and she didn't report to the CFO. She didn't report to someone who'd reported to them. A couple of months later, I made her the deputy CFO. And then she actually became the CFO till September. And she was uh, 30 at the time. You, you, you've got to pick people who are going to hard and ride up and lean right into it mm-hmm. and not be in denial about where we are. And then from there, that 100, some will drop off as well. It's the, it's the sporting team analogy mm-hmm. that I use, which people don't like, but I'll do it. If you like rugby league, AFL, soccer, cricket, whatever sport you follow, does the same team play on the field doing the same role and the same minutes every year? If you want to win a premiership, you want to be world class, do the same players play the same role every week? Do they play the same number of minutes? Right. So you, you have to... Think about the team really differently all the time. That doesn't mean they're bad people. That doesn't mean they're horrible people. It doesn't mean they've done the wrong, wrong thing. just might mean that they're not the team for the day. Or in the right position. Or in the right position. And we still need to rotate a lot more people around uh, at Toll. So first of all, you, ha- you have to find who your acolytes are and they don't have to be people who report to you. Right? Yeah. You don't, your team doesn't necessarily have to be only people who report to you. Your team is other like-minded people who are passionate, care deeply, are visionary, uh, can harden up, have a high pain threshold for change, are really resilient, and they might be other people deep in the business who are your jewels who who will spread the word more quickly because you don't have to go through all the hierarchy and the bureaucracy of reaching into the business. They tend to be more likely younger people. Who sets the strategy? Is that the chief exec? Is that the chief exec and Mr Mullen? Is that the chief exec, Mr Mullen, and the board? And who sets the strategy at Toll during this transformation program? 
Well, the strategy should be set by the global leadership team with a big dose of what the MD wants. The strategy's really, really interesting, I think. It's like the discussion around culture. Yep. I think people use the two words far too simply and easily all the time. So strategy, people who say we do strategy every year, well, I hate to tell you that's tactics because in a really big business, if you think you're doing strategy every year and changing your strategy, it probably takes two or three years for the strategy to take hold. So if you're changing it every year, it can't be strategy, it's tactics. Mm -hmm. So we did the strategy very, very early on with Bain and only maybe five or six people in the whole business. And we spent weeks and weeks and weeks on that, thinking that through. I think strategy comes from core economic data. So you build strategy from GDP, debt levels, your customers' annual reports, you have to strip all of them, you have to have deep insight into how your customers think, you need to go to your own balance sheet, your own cash flow, you have to look at the countries you want to be in, what are their demographics like? You have a very, very different story for uh, India where the average age is 29 about what your employment strategy is where there's 9% CPI wage growth they want 10% to Australia where you might be getting twos. So you have to you have to think really differently about strategy and, and strategy has to be very nuanced, but it gets built up from core economics, demographics, GDP, CPI, debt levels. Um, and then customers, for us, we have to overlay a deep amount of strategic thinking into our customers and our, verti- our 12 verticals. We're reviewing it this year, so... We notified the GLT, their strategy people, their finance people, that there's going to be a week. They must close their diaries and they will have a week sitting in the room in June where we will go through strategy, which will start with core economics. I I think, and I don't think I'm one of them, I think in my entire life I've met five or six people who are really good strategic thinkers. Everyone says they're into strategy. I think it takes a really multidimensional brain to do strategic thinking. Then there's the second part, which comes after the strategies, the implementation, otherwise it's not worth yep. doing the effort. That's a nice book on your bookshelf, <laughs> grab it in dust that no one looks at. Okay, but you said you've walked into the business, you've looked at the strategy, there's a new strategy, you've set the tone, then you've got to find those who are going to follow you. Mm-hmm. You also said earlier in, earlier in this discussion, you made a lot of changes fairly early on. What were the changes you made? And also, Michael, <laughs> how do you quickly go about saying, they're in, they're out. First of all, a lot of people self-select. And even if they don't tell you, you can tell they've self-selected. Yeah, right. And um, what you need to do is you need to be, you need to treat them with dignity, style and compassion, but they need to go fairly quickly. The money in the main is not the issue. And that's a very emotional thing. Uh, it's a very tough thing. We've let go well over 2,000 people so far since I've been there. And there's another 700 people who are going between March and August next year. That's That part of it is based on IT investment. Can't spend $400 million on IT and still have all the people. But I think you most people self-select, even if they don't know they have, they, their body language, their view, their conduct shows you that they have and you need to cut them out fairly quickly, otherwise it becomes all pervasive on their behaviour back into the rest of the organisation. Two, I think some people don't have the capability. Uh, We are a really global business. Over half our people aren't in this country. Most of of our people around the world, they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. Most of our growth is all coming from Asia. So if you've only lived in Melbourne and Sydney, and you've never run a business outside of Australia, yeah. and now you've got 4,000 people in China and you've never been there, you probably can't run that business in reality because you don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese, for starters. How are you going to communicate to your people? So you have to look at real capability, uh, and, and that's not intellect. So people self-select capability. You have to build people who you're going to trust and have great faith in. And then you need to let them go on their way. But in in our situation too, they need to realise my style. My style is not laissez-faire. My my style is fairly detail-minded and hard at and I have a very inquisitive mind. So I ask 
lots of questions all the time, which then people might not like that stylistically. Your style, what time do you start work in the morning? Well, it's, it's years of uh, training and years of lots of other things. So I get up about 4, 4.15 every morning. So it's a very disciplined mm. life. It's not. It's nearly monastic, people tell me, but I'm not a religious zealot either. Um, around 4, 4.15, because I used to train, I used to go running at 4.30 or I used to go to the pool at 5. Mm-hmm. Now I don't run because I'm too old and breaking down all the time. And um, so the office is set up at home or I have an office in my apartment in Melbourne or people have designed a really uh, agile IT system for me, so my phone, my iPad, everything works as normal as if I was in the office anywhere in the world, so I just turn on a I can do anything I want. So 4.15, I usually work unless I'm going for a walk or a swim in summer till about 7, mm-hmm. read everything that's coming overnight. So there's usually 70 or 80 emails that are coming overnight from around the world. And I do that six days a week. Sundays I try not to start at 4 and then shower, shave, shampoo, <laughs> off to my first meeting and then... I start to fade about 5 o'clock, so no meetings start after about 4.30 and then usually in bed about 8. Is that right? Bed by 8 o'clock? Yeah. You've got an international company, one of the biggest uh, we know of in Australia and overseas, stretched left to right, travelling a lot. When do you make the time to think? Well, not on planes. That is the... One of the worst things that could ever happen on a plane is if oh, I hate Wi-Fi on a plane and I don't. there should never be phones. That would be a disaster. Planes are for sleeping and I, I can sleep anywhere as long as we need to. Thinking, some of the, the best times of thinking for me were, are swimming because no one can talk to you. <laughs> you can't answer the phone. And there's no pages or anything like that. So I like swimming's good for one or two things, absolutely cleaning your mind out and dumbing it right down and just counting to 28, which is how long, how many strokes you've got to get to the end before your tumble turn. Or just thinking. Running was very good for me for thinking. Ski paddling where to really think deeply and untangle my mind, I don't want anyone else to talk to. I want to untangle my own mind first. So I tend to do that. I think um, the other thing I love to do is I'm a voracious reader. So I read a lot of anything and everything. That helps me think as well, reading. So they're probably the two things where I get a lot of my my thinking time from. You don't actually at work have much time to think. You're in uh, meetings nearly back to back, you're reading financial reports, you are dealing with issues, you're seeing customers. You're not actually thinking, you're doing. That's right. So, and then in the office, people want to see you. People want to press the flesh. They don't want to talk to you. They've got needs and wants and so are you. So some of that's about that interaction. So there's very little time at work in the office to think. So I tend to do it if I'm swimming, ski paddling or when I used to run. So in terms of thinking, where is the future of logistics going to be in the next five, ten years? You talked about technology briefly. Can you sort of give us an understanding? Because we've had people in here talk about AI in particular Mm -hmm. in logistics. Do you see the driverless trucks? Is that all fantasy or what do you actually see? How big will be robotics in the the business? So I'll start with customers. That's... So at my level, I'm I'm very privileged to see a lot of senior people around the world. And they only ever, except for the miners and the oil and gas and a couple of other people, they always start the discussion with safety. So the the big end of those type of things is about safety and rightly so, you're carting uranium, explosives, acids, blah, blah, blah. Most other people, there's three questions and they're the same three questions and they come up all the time. One, what can you do? How will you help me? What is the action item to reduce the working capital in my business by increasing the velocity of the movement of the inventory so I can convert it to cash more quickly? Two, question two, what is your IT investment that helps with question one? Question three, do you have the people, the smarts, the capability 
to drive question two to get me to question one. And you can cut it all up and that is basically how every MD around the world talks about how they're not interested in the thing they have, it's how in the main, it's how they drive their balance sheet, their cash flow so they can continue to invest in the things they need for the future. So that, that's one. Two, we, we have robotics now. We, we've got a magnificent facility here called Preston's doing e-commerce. I think it's got 37,000 SKUs. You ring up now and place an order for those customers and it will be withdrawn from the robotically pick, packed, scanned, vacuumed, contracted to a, the smallest shape it can be. That anywhere in Australia will be on the dock ready to go in 30 minutes from when you make the phone call. You look at some of the big investments in robotics, they're happening every day. Woolworths have just opened, supposedly, I haven't seen it yet, the most advanced warehouse system yeah. in Australia at Mulgrave. There's hardly any people there. Yeah. Um, you look at even 10 years ago, Lynn Fox built a shed at Kellogg's. I think it went from 80 people to 20. So robotics are real. I think two things aren't real or aren't in my working lifetime, which is electrification of heavy truck fleet. And everyone's talking about it. We need to stay with reality. There isn't actually yet a fully commercial online production, mass-produced truck. Fuso, I think, are making the first this year. They're making 400 of them. They weigh 1.8 tonne more than a diesel vehicle. Mm. They only go 160 kilometres, something like that, and they're three times the price of a diesel truck. So when the customers tell me they want to take 1.8 tonne less freight for 160 k's and it costs three times as more, we'll make it all commercial. Mm. So And they will overcome this. It's Moore's law in batteries. They will overcome the weight issues and the generation. Autonomous vehicles, you can do autonomous vehicles now if you want to. On Eisenhower's freeways, a couple of autobahns in Europe and maybe Sydney, Melbourne. And again, they will overcome this. If you talk to Daimler and Volvo, the two largest truck manufacturers in the world, I think, 2025, 2030, 2035, our main problem at the moment is radar. You need an inner and an outer paint line. Paint line. You think about driving around Sydney, Melbourne, country Victoria, country New South Wales, country Queensland, mm. there is no shoulder paint line. So the truck can't read it. If you go to Japan, one of the big problems with paint lines is they paint lines down the middle of the lane so the truck doesn't actually know oh, really? what is the lane. So there's, there's got to be some technical things be overcome, and they will do this. People talk about platooning. You can put more trucks together and they'll all be platooning. Well, Australia's done that since the 40s. They're called road trains. So mm. a lot of people are high on hype about these things. A lot of things have been done for a long period of time. Road trains, B-doubles in Australia. There's only two countries that do them, I think, Australia and Canada, and... and that is real advanced technology. It doesn't look like it because we're so used to it. So where, what do you see the next three to five years? And you said you had, you're doing your catch-up again this year to review this strategy. Yep. Are you, are you happy of what you've achieved in your first couple? Oh, I've never been happy about what I've achieved at work. It's not an MD's job to be happy. An MD must keep pushing the business along because the world's changing so quickly. Like who would have thought? I want anyone to tell me that they would have thought two and a bit years ago the Poms would have left Europe. Donald Trump would have got elected. We would have had Chinese Premier declare lifetime. Lifetime. We would have. We would, we would have gone through three prime ministers or whatever it is, and not be deemed in the same category as Italy. Um, who would have thought these things would have happened? Who would have thought interest rates would be before charges like one point five percent? Who would have thought that the world economy would have been its greatest growth rate this century and we'd be in 11 years, it's 11 years since the last global crisis yeah. and it's still going up. The tom-toms are beating. We're beating all long-term trajectory since uh, the Great Depression. MDs have got to push the envelope and push businesses harder because the change is so rapid and so unpredictable. Those things about China, Brexit, Trump, 
would all be unpredictable. So how do you keep yourself educated? I'm a voracious reader of anything and everything. If you put something in front of me, I'll read it. I think that you have to have a deeply curious mind. I, I think that uh, the people who are who feel the most self-confident in this environment are people who read so much so they can try to understand. People who don't read and don't listen uh, and live in their own world, well, the seven and a half billion people around them and they're going to get crushed by that. So I'm trying to read everything I can, anything I can from the Daily Telegraph, the new idea, all the way to, <laughs> all the way to, uh, which I read last year, which Australia's foreign policy document. So I read anything and everything because it's a, it's a mosaic that you have to try to put together. What about books? What books do you read? Well, I send books, uh, Christmas presents. A lot of the people at work get books for Christmas, uh, which is a very difficult thing. This year they got one of my favourite books, which was. Uh, one Crowded Hour of Glorious Life, which is about a famous Australian uh, newsreel war photographer called Davis out of Tasmania who got killed in uh, after he spent all his life in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia who got killed in a uh, pretend coup in Bangkok. So I send books. The, my favourite book, which I sent the year before, which no one has read, is actually – I because I, I love ancient history, is The Peloponnesian Wars by Thucydides, which is the world's first – historical book actually, and uh, talks about the great conflict between Athens and Sparta originally. But that is a hard read, but I, I, I like those type of things. So I read a lot of history. And when you're reading history, you're learning, you're reading about battlefields, you're reading about leadership, you're reading about like conquering, growth, etc. How do you surround yourself as, a, as the general from the Peloponnesian War to have the best soldiers around you to take this, this oh, business think- forward? So how do you make the call on your individuals? So I, I don't. I read a lot of military books, but I read a lot of other books too in, in history. I don't like actually, and I don't think it migrates well to business, particularly in this day and age, about military. So I don't like those analogies uh, predominantly. I think they turn a lot of the young people off. And mm-hmm. you know, very diverse. Where you're trying to create a very diverse business, I think that you have to be very careful about that. What I think. How do you select people? Unfortunately, I'm still old-fashioned. I am. So I see it as a great strength. Uh, Some people, my own daughter sees it as a great weakness, Sarah, who's uh, now officially the smartest person in the family. She's training as a nuclear scientist, I understand, so she's telling me how smart she is. Um, So she doesn't like what I would consider really core common courtesy and manners some people now would see as very old-fashioned and very divisive. So in the main, I still look for a lot of old-fashioned things. I like people to be on time or early. I like people to dress appropriately. Um, if you're, you're going for an executive job, a, a really top executive job, and you think showing up in a, a shirt with jeans, well, it's unlikely I'm going to employ you. If you, if you swear a lot, and a lot of it, people swear a lot, and I've been known to swear a lot too in circumstances. I just don't think that's really suitable in, in the top end of town, particularly in a multi-jurisdictional global business where those things can be seen as really offensive around the world. So I look for people who are really confident in their own skin without being rude or arrogant. Mm, okay. I look for people who are confident for the fight. And that could be fighting with me. You don't take it personal? No. As long as they don't. And they've got to leave it at the door. Once they walk out, it's got to be all over in four or five minutes. I I look for people who are resilient, have a high pain threshold. I look for people who can articulate their argument. And we're not in academia. I don't want someone to write a 40-page thesis to me. I want them to be able to summarize. There's lots of rules around how you can write at toll, which I got taught at my Nicholas. If you can't write your argument, your whole argument, no matter how complex it is, in three pages, you don't know your argument should go in the bin. You cannot do a slide presentation for anything that's over 12 pages, including the cover. If you want $100 million, 
it's three pages at most. Right. If you can't articulate it and make a whole lot of people understand it, you don't understand it. So people need really good core math skills. We're dealing in hundreds of millions of dollars. Our wages bill here is $4.138 billion. It's our biggest single lever. If you don't, we're a small margin business. If you can't understand maths and how a balance sheet works and a cash flow works, how can I give you a $500 million business to run? So look for people who are self-confident in their own skin. I like people who are confident that you can't actually hurt them in the argument. I think a lot of people get hurt in the argument and, and that's a really distressing thing for both both of us because I want to interrogate the numbers. I want to interrogate you. And, it doesn't, and that doesn't mean shouting or screaming or stamping your feet or spitting like a camel. That means working through the the deepness of the, what you're trying to say. And a lot of people don't like that. So you've got the character to back it up. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not about unpeeling you. It's about unpicking the argument. In an international role, you have the opportunity to see different organisations, different countries. A couple of things we're going to cover off is the broader theme, not just not in toll but outside of toll, say Australia. Where do you see Australia setting itself as a country preparing to take on or to grow into the world? say the economy for exports, and are we educating the right way? I know you've got some few thoughts around mathematics, but do you want to sort of talk us through sort of your holistic views on those? Well, I'll give two. So this would be my view, and I'm sure lots of people have different views. Since 1945, nearly the greatest thing that has happened, in my view, to improve, and it doesn't come without costs and doesn't come with everything's perfect, but if you look at survival rates you're from birth, you look at mortality, you look at life expectancy, you look at economics, you look at global trade, you look at income for everyone around the world, you look at how many people have been pulled out of poverty around the world, you look at we've got rid of around the world things like uh, measles, mumps, polio, Standard of living has gone up around the world. You look at diversity, you look at how females have been treated, the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Globalisation did that. <laughs> the movement to globalisation, an interconnected world where everyone's so connected, they can't really do too much. They can't argue for it. I think globalisation is also prevented in some ways a mass conflict. We're in the largest or longest period now for centuries without a mass conflict. Globalisation did that. The free movement of people, trade, immigration, currency has helped drag all of us. Australians, I think, in the end of the Second World War, men lived to 56. Mm. I think we're at 80. Some will say that's not a good thing for some of us, but <laughs> um, it's fantastic but now we're talking about nationalism, tariffs, 1st of March, isolationism, building walls, stopping immigration. We are trying to unwind some of the greatest things that have happened to human civilization because we have a, a different view. We need to stop people coming to countries. We need to build walls. We need to put tariffs up. We're going to reinvent cars and go back to car manufacturing. Wasn't that something in the paper, the AFR, yesterday about that? Like, it's straight economics. It ain't going to work. Like, why? You have to pay to your comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. So the first thing about the world is we need, to, we need to keep changing and developing and evolving, but we need to think about how fantastic things are. Australia has been what, had 29 years of economic growth. In the OECD, it's unheard of. Mm. If you read The Economist only a couple of months ago, it was on the front page. Why is Australia different to the rest of the world? Then I think two things. We are not, though. We're not, we need to be outward-looking. Australia needs to be extremely outward-looking. We are 25 million people, and within nine hours of Sydney, there's only 4.5 billion. If we think we're going to be isolationist and insular, we're going to get crushed. 
You got China at 1.3 billion, second largest economy in the world, second largest military power, soon to be the largest uh, financial power. You've got India, the largest population in the world in five years. It's going from number nine to number five in the world. You've got the US, Japan, China and India will be four of the five top economic countries in the world and they're all in our economic zone, Asia, Pac, Indian Ocean. So if we think that we're going to hold back the tide and be nationalistic and isolationist and no immigration and we're going to hold back Southeast Asia, we've lost the plot. That is our homeland. Asia and the subcontinent is our homeland. And to do that, we need to do two things. The need, in my view, there needs to be absolutely more investment, core thinking around language, okay. Mandarin, Cantonese, Erdi, Baza, Thai, Vietnamese. It's not Latin. Like it was only what seven or eight years ago, there was more people learning Latin than there was Mandarin. Well, unless we're all going to be Jesuit priests, why do we need Latin at all? We should be we should be outward facing to the economics. We need to educate our children. You go to Singapore, you've got to do English and Mandarin. You go to China, you've got to do Mandarin, Cantonese or a version of one of those and English. You go to Japan, you've got to do Japanese and English. My Cindy, Mm -hmm. my famous and amazing EA, who I shouldn't have, who is seriously amazing, speaks, writes, does mathematics in Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, English and does a little bit of Thai. That is the future Mm -hmm. on if we're going to be really effective and move around the world has to be language-based and then mathematics. And, yep, we need everyone to be able to experience what they really need to make them happy. But how do you add up your bank account? How how do you pay your mortgage? And it can't be done on a computer or on your phone right? or get someone to do it for you. You've got to understand your own core numbers your own core earnings, and business is so mathematically driven. Mm. Business, people say to me, young people, well, how, how do I get to your job? All right? Can you tear apart a balance sheet? Can you read an annual report? Can you tell me where the cash is going? No. Well, you're not going to get to my job. Simple. There's the People, you need to be able to uh, understand the flow of money You need to understand how the money, the profit pool's made, where the profit pool comes from. You need to understand how it converts to cash. And you can have all the accountants, and I've got 1,038 of them, far too many, but I need to understand it because in the end I'm the one signing off on billions of dollars of investment. Do you have or have you had mentors? Look, I've had some people who have, I think, uh, defining people, my mother, obviously, John Ledeek, the Fox family, Bill Kelty, more recent times probably John Mullen. Yeah. I wouldn't say they're mentors. I would say that they are people who have pushed and pulled me and questioned me and encouraged me to think differently all the time. I've never had a, a coach or anything like that. Never I've, had one? No. No, I've had lots of soccer coaches. I've had a really good rugby union coach who told me you should go and play soccer. (laughs) Uh, So I've had some good coaches. Um, I've never had a paid coach or anything like that or I never wanted one. Um, I think that you have to find your own level who you're willing to talk to. I I think you have to think about who you relate to the most. Like some of the people who have given me the the biggest feedback, uh, and I've known a lot of them, most of my sport has always been around chippies, plumbers, bricklayers, those type of thing. A lot of them are my mates today who have been known to throw actual stones at me but um, (laughs) uh, because it's a very different world. There'll be no high pretenses here for them. They're some of the ones who give some of the best advice, Mm. more about, are you burning yourself out? Can you do it? Why are you doing it? Etc. There's a lot of always questions around those type of things because the lifestyle's so different. My mother, my mother's uh, very, very. My mother's seventy nine and still works three days a week, charging fourteen hundred dollars a day to speak to her. Uh, she believes that you work till you drop dead. 
well, I'm not going to do that. Drop, drop dead, hopefully, but also uh, work till I'm 79. But she loves it. I think the other, obviously, the other big defining moment of my life, or the biggest, the, the biggest decision I ever made, was marrying Leah. As, as Hitler found out, you can't fight on two fronts. You, you can't, you can't <laughs> fight on two fronts. So a, a great joke, and and Leah's done an amazing job. And I don't worry about too much at home or the kids and, and Lee has been able to do all of that and she's been incredibly supportive because for many years, as I said, I go to Hong Kong tonight, I do about half my time overseas. So yeah, right. I'd be away, I think my worst year ever, I was away 227 nights, not days. Jeez. So you need you need that great support and um, Lee does that as very independent, very strong-willed as well. Can I ask you your um, your thoughts around the political environment? We're not getting too too in depth, but you've dealt with the unions for a long time. Core skill, I oh, are. Yeah, yeah. Where do you see the political environment supporting and engaging with business? Well, first of all, I, I think businesses need to take responsibility to run, to run their businesses and invest on much longer terms and outside the political cycle. So. I don't want any of our people to talk about the politics of the country unless you're in a really command and control environment. So because most of our investments are five years, ten years, the ships that are coming on board are a 25-year investment. Right. Whoever the politician is of the day, who cares? Yeah. It doesn't even actually matter who the MD is of the day. I won't be here in 25 years. So a lot of our investments, particularly the big hard architecture, infrastructure, shipping, aviation, property, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. So don't get caught up in thinking politically. Two, I think the political situation is a reflection of the disenchantment of people. But so is... People are disenchanted with business as well. You only have to look at the Banking Royal Commission here yeah. and behaviour. Yeah. People at Toll are extremely disappointed. You speak to the old timers here that they say, we lost $5 billion. You're now sacking 3,000 people. You're closing. They're very disappointed and upset that these things happen. Mm. So there's a lot of faith being lost in leadership, not yeah. just at a political class yeah. but at a business class as well. The trust. The trust, the trust has been broken down because people aren't, in my view, they're too politically correct, which I try never to be, and they're not authentic enough. So you don't follow the PC route? No. <laughs> I don't have the stomach for it. And I don't think people should. Um, and I don't I don't think people. it does matter as much as people say we're in a public company or a private company. I think that people just take the path of least resistance or the easiest path, and I don't think there is any easy path. There shouldn't be any easy path for me. I've got 44,000 people who are depending on me to lead appropriately or, or be fired. I think that the big problem in Australia politics at the moment is the instability, not about whether it's Liberal or Labor. It's about the instability and the unpredictability of it. Business for investment wants predictability and stability. We've had one, two, three, four, five, six, six changes of Prime Minister. So one, two, three, four. Four of the six are without an election, aren't they? Is that right? Just off the top of my head. So the will of the people on who they, even in our system, they're still voting for a Prime Minister regardless of in the main our election system. Changing then four Prime Ministers, Gillard, Bacterard, et cetera, mm -hmm. Morrison, who's my local member, et cetera. We had uh, Abbott change, yeah. those four. The people going, well, I'm not heard. We voted one way and then the party changes it. Well, that's unpredictable instability and, and people are not happy with it. But is business putting their, their thoughts forward enough? Well, I don't. Well, why not? Because I think uh, that's not my job uh, and... But your job, but your That's job a is a waste to, of time. But isn't the job to help grow the economy? Uh, I can do that in, in my business world without other influences in the main. Changing a point here or half a point here on tax or half a point on depreciation—that's all irrelevant nonsense in reality. 
The models don't look at that. We take a, a long-term view. We put in our sensitivity tests and it's not as important for, for us. It may be for some other industries. I, I've got enough of my own problems and enough of my own issues with fixing our business and looking after Japan Post uh, for me not to get involved in that. I also don't believe personally, uh, which is very confrontational for a lot of people, uh, that um, I don't believe businesses should do social engineering. So that's another reason why I don't get in, into the politics of things. Michael, looking uh, back as the young man many years ago starting off driving that truck as a 12-year-old to today, is there any advice you'd, uh, you'd look back and give Michael Byrne? I think that uh, there, there'd be a couple. There'd be a couple. I think I would have gone back to uni again in my 20s if I, if I now. Learning, deep learning, deep experiences engaging with other people. And if you notice, none of my education, real education, was done in Australia. It was right. done in the US, picking the best universities in the world. I had someone who was willing to pay for it and I got handcuffed for years. Oh, I would have done that again. I would have gone again. I should have gone. I had an opportunity at Mainz to go in my late 20s. I should have taken, I took, I took an STI instead of the education. I should have given them the money and said, I'll, I'll be educated. Education is what sets you free. If you think that in your 20s or 30s, you're going to be smart enough to compete with four and a half billion people in your 40s and 50s and keep your income and your job, you're, you're wrong in my view. Yeah. I would have gone again on education earlier, not a way to my 30s. The, the only reason why I have the jobs I do, or one of the reasons, is because I had all that education, could think really differently, had a different exposures, I think the only, and I don't have regrets, the only, the only thing I'd have a regret, I would have liked to have had a real crack at North America and live there. Um, to the scale of the market. Just the scale and the real big end of town and you want to you want to play A grade. Mm. You should want to play A grade. I think that a lot of our young people are world class. A lot of our young people are world class. They come out of... Uh, education schools here that are very, very good. But if they want to reach their potential, they need to go and work in Asia or North America. And I would have liked to have done that. I had a chance when I was 31. I just had three babies and Leah said no, and that yeah. was the end of that. And I would have liked to have had a crack at that. I think it's really the other thing which now I'm breaking down, I think it's unbelievably important, uh, which a lot of senior people don't do, uh, they don't keep fit. They don't keep fit, and you can't you can't motor along at the pace you need to be if you're not fit and healthy. You just can't back up day after day. You are playing A grade if you're running a billion dollar business, and if you're not looking after yourself, you can't function. And we see a lot of people who, in their fifties, just can't function properly anymore. So I've broken down. I need to find a way to try to keep fitter and keep healthy and I think it's really important people do that and think about their lifestyle and I know everyone laughs when I say I go to bed at 8 or 8 30 and I try not to drink three nights a week or four nights a week etc 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 you, you can't survive mm. unless you are disciplined last question for you when you made your big calls as a CEO ultimately the buck stops with you mm. and you made some big bets who do you go and double check it with before you make your call no one is that true no one. Because if you do, you've got doubt on the decision you've just made and you want someone else to affirm it so you can abdicate your responsibility and make yourself feel better. Well, on that, I'd just like to thank Michael. Thank you very much for coming today. It's been a great privilege to meet with you. Have a great journey tonight and look forward to staying in touch yeah. from here on. Thank you very much for the discussion. Hopefully it was enjoyable and uh, all the best to everyone in yourself, Greg. Great. You'll be listening to No Limitations. Mm -hmm.